In 1996, Australia's longest running manhunt began as one of the country's most notorious serial killers started his spree, abducting and killing three young women from the same popular night spot and police couldn't stop him. Why was this? And why was he able to haunt Western Australia for decades and roam free amongst the community without a trace? And how did he avoid getting caught despite this being one of Australia's longest running and most resource heavy investigations in its history? And yet police had no answers. In this video, we're going to uncover exactly what happened, who did it and why it took over 20 years to finally catch one of the most infamous serial killers Australia has ever seen. Well, it all started on the night of January 26, 1996, in the Perth suburb of Claremont, when 18-year-old Sarah Spears disappeared after spending the night with her friends at the Claremont's Club Bayview. She was last seen at the club at approximately 2am when she told her friends that she was leaving to catch a taxi to go home. However, tragically, this was the last time she was ever seen again. Her disappearance triggered a massive search party across Claremont, and it was a huge shock to the community as Claremont was well known as a friendly place and one of the safest suburbs in Perth. It was only a matter of days until the investigation investigation prompted one of the first mass saliva testings in Australia's history. Police asked to swap all local taxi drivers and police officers in order to eliminate themselves from the inquiry, and anyone who refused would be tracked down. These DNA samples could then be used as evidence when they found Sarah's body. However, the problem was, Sarah was never found. She came up to me and said, oh, I'm going to go home now. And I said, no, why don't you just wait? And she, said, she just said, no, I'm going. So what exactly did happen to Sarah Spears? At 2 a.m., Sarah walked down to the nearby phone booth and called for a taxi. This was a Telstra branded phone booth. This detail will become important later. After calling at exactly 2.06 a.m., Sarah then waited for the taxi. This can be backed up as three eyewitnesses claim to have seen Sarah waiting there on the corner of Sterling Road. However, moments later, they claimed to have seen an unidentified car pull up beside it where she was waiting. At 2.09 a.m., exactly three minutes after Sarah's call for the taxi, the taxi arrived, but mysteriously, Sarah disappeared and she was never seen again. However, there were reports by several residents to have heard three long, really loud, horrible female screams at nearby Mosburn Park, with one eyewitness stating they were loud enough for me to jump out of bed. But when she went outside to investigate, she saw nothing and it was completely silent with no cars. And tragically, this was the last time Sarah was ever heard from again. This only marked the start of one of Australia's most infamous serial murder mysteries as the case took over 20 years to crack. But unfortunately, Sarah Spears' disappearance was only just the beginning, as another the young woman suffered the same fate. In the early hours of Sunday the 9th of June, 23 year old woman Jane Rimmer mysteriously vanished at Bayview Hotel. Jane was out with her friends drinking on a night out. Her friends opted on going home early, but Jane decided to stay on. Jane was last seen on CCTV footage talking to a mysterious man outside the club who later on became the prime suspect in Jane's disappearance. The only problem was he was unidentifiable giving his placement in the frame and the blurry footage quality. Additionally, what made this CCTV footage even more infuriating for the police was that it was such old technology that the security camera footage was recorded on a circuit alongside other cameras, so it only recorded a short amount of footage from different angles across the pub once every minute or two. So the next available footage of Jane after she was seen laughing with the man, she'd already disappeared. This only caused Claremont to go into a state of panic as this was the second woman to go missing from the same place within the last six months. The people of Claremont and the police work frantically to raise awareness of Jane's disappearance to help find her. What's going on with the two women that have gone missing? However, it was only a matter of time before Jane's body was found. On the 3rd of August, 40 kilometers to the south of Perth, exactly 55 days after Jane went missing, a young woman with her children was on a morning walk in the bush and stumbled across Jane's naked body. The body was left face down underneath some leaves and sticks. Jane had a severe slit wound to the front of her neck and cuts on her right arm from her attempts to defend herself from the attacker. Now police knew that they were dealing with a serial killer and were on high alert. This took things to the next level with more patrols around the area and asking women out at night for their whereabouts. The Claremont police strongly insisted for women to take more precautions in not traveling alone and being safe at night. However, it was increasingly concerning that there were such high numbers of women hitchhiking at night and walking home by themselves. I wouldn't come out here on my own, that's for sure. Really scary. It doesn't make you feel very safe here at all. Everyone feels the same, they won't come into Claremont at all. When you've had a couple of drinks and that, you don't think about safety. I don't, I just don't think it. However, it was only a matter of time, the third woman to go missing, Kiara Glennon. Kiara went missing at the same time and the same place as Jane, 4am from the Bayview Hotel. But at this stage, locals knew all too well of how incredibly scary this situation is. Kiara told her friends that she was heading off home and left the hotel at approximately 12am. She went presumably off to get a taxi, heading 
towards that same corner of Sterling Road. She was last seen by two eyewitnesses who yelled out to her saying, hey, don't hitchhike. But Kiara waved off their statement, dismissing it and kept on walking. These same eyewitnesses saw a slow moving car drive up along the street where it eventually pulled over and they saw Kiara bobbing down with her hands on her knees talking to the driver. These eyewitnesses said the next time they looked, she was gone. It was only until the 3rd of April, 17 days after Kiara went missing until she was found in Yanshep National Park, 50 kilometers north of Perth, alongside Pipidini Road. She was found with many stab wounds and a bad cut to her throat, surrounded by some small acacia trees. Police said she put up a hell of a fight. And it was in this fight, through her self-defense, Kira managed to scratch the attacker, ultimately providing DNA evidence that would be crucial later on. The murder sent even more shockwaves through Claremont. Things weren't the same anymore, as this has been the third time a young, innocent woman had lost their life. Women and families were scared to leave their home, knowing there was a killer on the loose, and not knowing when he may strike again, with police efforts not bringing up any substantial leads. This only created more panic, and media students were covering this every night about finding the killer, the Claremont serial killer. Police were heavily under the pump, but kept on coming up short. They worked endlessly, sifting and searching the areas, using all the technology and forensics they could, but kept coming to a dead end. There were no answers. So who actually did murder these women and why did it take over 20 years to solve? Well, this is due to a number of reasons. Firstly, we must understand that the technology back there was merely not even close to anything as it is right now in the present. More specifically, DNA technology. They were conducting hundreds of saliva tests of taxi drivers per day, but even the most advanced machinery took days to process just one sample. So on the DNA front, police were fighting a losing battle. But as it turns out, in hindsight, the perpetrator wasn't in fact a taxi driver anyway, leading this massive swabbing operation merely just a waste of resources. Police across all three of the murders strenuously filled out something they called a location register. This was a large mapping of the Claremont area with the following key. Dark blue, a person. Light blue, person in a vehicle, green for unoccupied vehicles, and red for instances they weren't sure about. These location registers were so heavy on police resources, interviewing around 2,000 people and their whereabouts, with the idea of finding that one grey dot, which would be the person they are looking for, the murderer. However, this was never the case, because despite police's best efforts tracking down everyone on their whereabouts at the time, the killer was completely untraceable through this method, as he was never able to be identified this way. Remember, all three of these abductions happened at night around 12 to 2 a.m. This mapping register technique did help eliminate people from their investigation, but Claremont being so big with so many people in it, it didn't help them too much in the broad scheme of things. The killer was clever, undetected, and masked by the darkness. The pressure was mounting on police, and months and months went by. They even employed someone from America's FBI who helped profile this serial killer. However, it wasn't long until police would arguably make one of the biggest mistakes in the investigation, where somebody internally leaked information to the media. So to understand this, we need to establish the following. The police task force was setting up secret patrols around Claremont, specifically around the streets near the Bayview Hotel, where the previous three girls had gone missing. Police would look out for and follow specific vehicles who would act suspicious around the area. During one of these patrols, police found a man who was seen doing around 30 laps around the same young woman, and he would only stop and talk to the woman if he wasn't being followed and there was nobody else around. At the time, this was a seemingly huge breakthrough, but it was crucial that this information stay private, so police could gather more key info on the man and ideally catching him doing something incriminating that could prove he was indeed the Claremont killer. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. The media and public were so sure they found the man, Lance Williams, but it wasn't at all what it seemed. Lance as a consequence was followed for weeks, his every move followed by police, his house with his parents searched, his carpets were replaced and secret cameras installed in his home. He was all over the news and arguably at the time the most hated and scrutinised man in the whole of Australia. But there was one big problem, Lance wasn't the serial killer. And that's why this information being leaked was such a tragic scenario. Not only to Lance because he was innocent, but also to the police with the pressure to lock him up. Police had no evidence on Lance whatsoever, only the suspicion of seeing him follow women in Claremont. But still, there was no evidence to link him to the murders. His fingerprints were taken, his DNA was thoroughly analysed in the lab to find any possible link to Jane and Kieran's body, but there was no match. Whilst it's safe to assume Lance was a creepy man living with his parents, he definitely wasn't the Claremont serial killer. But even so, the police weren't convinced. Despite having no evidence for years, at this point the police were still adamant that this man Lance was the killer. Because since they've been following and watching Lance, there's been no more killing since. But the reality of it was, since the leaking of Lance being the prime suspect and the fact that he was being watched 24-7, the actual serial killer knew that if he killed
killed again while Lance was under police guards, Lance would no longer be the prime suspect. So one of the biggest mistakes from the macro task force was trying to convict Lance, an innocent man. They were using up a huge amount of resources on this one guy to purely just find evidence to convict Lance when he was never even the criminal in the first place. But this didn't stop police from making the same mistake again. Eight years later, the investigation took a turn and focused on searching Peter Wages, a former mayor of Claremont. And this was done for a few reasons. He declined to give a saliva DNA sample to police. He was one of the very few people who advocated for Lance's rights under intense 24-7 supervision. And lastly, he fitted that FBI agent's description of someone who could have lived a double life. More on that FBI agent later. Once again, police watched him, searched him, and stripped his house for any evidence they could find. Meanwhile, his reputation being completely ruined. However, unlike Lance, Peter was released from suspicion only weeks later. But evidently, the leads police were following weren't going nowhere, and they had zero evidence against anybody at all. This case grew cold. After all police resources, all investigations, and all questions, police still came away with nothing. So who was the Claremont serial killer, and how did they eventually get caught? Well, the answer is actually pretty surprising. On December the 22nd, 2016, over 20 years after the investigation started in 1996, a man was finally arrested for the murders of these three women. So two questions present themselves. Who did it and how were they caught? So let's start on how they were caught. So in 2008, the police made a breakthrough. A specialist lab in the United Kingdom ran further tests on one of Kiara Glennon's fingernails and found a small trace of an unknown man's DNA in the sample. This sample matched a perpetrator in the WA police database who brutally raped a 17-year-old woman in the Karakata Cemetery in 1995. This was a breakthrough as they now knew that the Claremont serial killer had committed other crimes within the area, that they may be able to possibly link to him to therefore find this serial killer's identity. But it wasn't until 2016 until police made a major breakthrough whilst looking through local cold cases. In 1988, a man broke into an 18-year-old girl's bedroom attacking her. However, he didn't stay long as the woman's screams forced him to flee from the scene, leaving behind a kimono jacket. This kimono jacket was retested in 2016 and the sperm on it matched the unknown man's DNA from Kiara Glenn's fingernail. At the time of this crime in 1988, fingerprints were taken across doorknobs around the area as the man was believed to be walking around and stealing women's underwear in the nearby streets. But miraculously, these fingerprints could be matched to a man already on police file from a case in 1990 where he attacked a social worker at a hospital. And then due to this link, police finally had a name. Bradley Edwards. Police quickly tracked down the man and even managed to get his DNA from a sprite bottle he discarded while at the movies with his stepdaughter. The DNA was a perfect match to the DNA found from Kira Glennon's fingernails. They finally got him. But you might be wondering, since he was already on file for a crime, why wasn't he found quicker? Well, his assault in 1990 at the hospital was labelled as a common assault on police files, and during the police's investigation, they were only looking at known sexual assaults on file in the area and not went into the broader assaults category. Bradley Edwards was a 52 year old man. Married twice, the former Telstra technician worker lived with his wife and stepdaughter in their suburban home. He lived a relatively quiet life and he regularly volunteered at his stepdaughter's little athletics club. Bradley Edwards did admit to the attack of the 18 year old girl at her home in 1988 and the rape and abduction of the 17 year old girl at the Karakata Cemetery in 1995. However, he denied he was a killer and had nothing to do with the Claremont murders. But DNA evidence proved otherwise. A seven month long trial began on September the 24th and Edwards was found guilty of the murder of Jane Rimmer and Kiara Glennon. DNA evidence was used and lots of witnesses were caught up in the trial. However, due to the lack of evidence, he was acquitted of the murder of Sarah Spears, as to this day, Sarah's body has not been found. The judge ruled it was likely he murdered Sarah Spears, but it couldn't be proven beyond reasonable doubt. At the time of the conviction in 2020, 52-year-old Bradley Edwards was sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 40 years. Bradley will most likely die in prison. Thankfully, after all those years, Bradley Edwards was finally caught and convicted. However, till this day, the family family of Sarah Spears still plead for justice and closure since Sarah has never been found. However, somebody claims to know her whereabouts. Back in 1996 on the morning of the 27th of January, an anonymous horse trainer doing track work claims to have seen a man holding a shovel and suspiciously emerge from the bushes in the Perth Hills at dawn the same day Sarah went missing. The trainer also claims to have seen a white Telstra van parked alongside the road. But till this day, police state there is no evidence for these claims and the whereabouts of Sarah Spears remain unknown.